Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending the webinar today. Today we are going to be listening to Jason Sissler, who is the director of Vision Quest Coaching. His webinar is called Practical Application of Power-Based Training. And we also have Tammy Saddle with us, who is my coworker. She will be fielding questions that you guys have. My name is Kelly Bays, and I am an account manager here at Training Peaks. Um, and with that said, we have just a few housekeeping items to go over before we start. If you guys have any questions, in your GoToMeeting screen on the right side, there's a questions box. So just go ahead and type your question in there, whether it's for Training Peaks or Jason, and Tammy should be able to answer it to the best of her ability. Uh, if Jason, if the question is for Jason, uh, we were going to field questions at the end of the webinar, and we'll pick a few questions for as much time as we have, and then any questions that are not answered, um, hopefully you guys can get in touch with Jason at a later date, or submit a support ticket to Training Peaks, and we'll handle them from there. So um, another thing is, if you guys can't hear the webinar at any point, just in case there's some kind of audio issue, uh, just let us know in the question box, and we'll ho uh, hopefully resolve it really quickly. Okay, so I just wanted to show you guys really quick um, in a Training Peaks account since Jason will be going over power based files. And this is the map and graph view of a Training Peaks uploaded workout. So just to back up, here is a Training Peaks calendar. And if you upload a file with power in it, you'll see the workout quick view. If you click on map and graph, that's how you get all of that data can be really useful for your training as Jason will go over. And then if you click on this reports tab is where you can see a lot of different charts that will help you further analyze your data. If you need help with your account or uploading a file, just go into Training Peaks and click on support in the upper left hand corner. And then down on the left here you can click on compatible devices and we have a list of devices that you can upload to Training Peaks. If you have a question about Training Peaks at any point, please, please, please submit a support ticket to us because we love getting support tickets and we want to make sure that you guys know what you're doing in your account. So click on support and then click on contact us. And that's how you can get to us. And we usually have a turnaround time of a day or so and that's not including weekends. So. Um, and then one last thing, if you want to sign up for additional webinars or if you want to watch Jason's webinar a little bit later, you can do so by going to Support Center, click on Personal Edition, and then click on Webinar Schedule. And this is where all the webinars are listed that you can sign up for and that you can watch again. So one more thing, I was kidding before. Um, we're going to conduct a few polls and we'll just do them really quick and then Jason will get started. So the poll should pop up on your window right now if you just want to answer it really quick. And then we'll switch to the next one. Great. And we just have two more. And this is the last one, and then Jason will get started. Okay, great. So I'm going to hand it over to Jason right now. 
Okay. All right, thanks for joining me today. As Kelly said, I'm going to be talking about the practical application of power-based training. I work with Vision Quest Coaching. We're based out of uh, the Chicago area, and we also have some satellite facilities uh, in the suburbs as well as in Florida. Uh, a big thing that we've done with our coaching services is try to integrate power as often as we can. And what that does is allows us to see exactly what our athletes are doing on a daily basis. Um, Training Peaks has also been a, a huge part of doing that effectively. When I first started coaching with Vision Quest, we were trying to send plans and receive files back and, and information back from our athletes with uh, Excel sheets. And it was just kind of a time-intensive and laborious task to go through all of that to see what the athletes were actually doing, try to make the necessary adjustments, whereas everything now is a lot more streamlined because we can see the actual power and what they're really doing in training, as well as make almost instantaneous recommendations and feedback through training peaks. So as I go through this, we're going to start with uh, why we want to use power in training. Uh, the, the things that you always tend to hear, the power is objective, it's quantifiable, and it's consistent. So what I mean by that is that it's objective because uh, you can take a power-based workout or a power meter that you have on your bike, and it's going to be the same on Monday and Tuesday and a month from now and a year from now for the most part. There's some little drift and things like that that can happen as units wear in and, and they sort of change over time. But for the most part, you can count on the numbers that you get from your power meter being accurate. Um, it's the same kind of principle as going to a gym. If you want to lift weights or whatever and you're going to bench press 100 pounds, you want that 100 pounds to be the same in this gym and that gym and every other gym that you might go to, as well as obviously within the gym itself. So the second piece then is quantifiable. When you see numbers, whether it's 100 watts or 200 watts or 300 watts or whatever it is, you have real hard data that you can um, look at and compare from workout to workout. When you look at some of the other metrics that you have, you have hard numbers, but those numbers aren't necessarily quantifiable. With heart rate, you can't say that more is always better because that can be subject to a lot of different uh, factors going on within the body um, and things outside of training itself. And when you look at speed, it's subject to a lot of environmental factors. RP, again, it, like heart rate, is subject to a lot of factors. So then we get to the consistency. That's similar to the objectivity piece of it in that you want to be able to see those same things day after day after day. That's not to say that um, you're always going to be able to produce the same power for a given workout, but when you go out and hit a certain number, you can say that that, that given power, 200 watts, for instance, is the same as 200 watts that you've done in previous workouts. So the second piece then is that power is the work that you actually do rather than your body's response to the work that you do. In this case, I'm thinking particularly of heart rate and perceived exertion. That's not to say that either of those metrics are without value, but in both cases, they're a response to the effort that you've actually put in. Working harder in terms of producing more power is going to tend to make your heart rate go up. Same thing with perceived exertion. Higher power outputs are going to elicit a higher perceived exertion response. But for instance, if you're slightly dehydrated, uh, maybe at the end of a long training session or uh, you've had several weeks of fairly high training load, both that heart rate response and that perceived exertion response are going to be very different than what they would be earlier in the training phase or earlier in the training session when you were fresher and uh, more uh, ready to get out and do the work for the day. And while we're here, I'm going to go off on a slight side note and talk about the GPS for running. Garmin's have become a very popular uh, computer on the bike, but in running, they're also very useful because you're essentially getting the same thing when you have pace ready at hand as what you have on the bike with a power meter. The run is great because pace is the same as speed, but you don't have the same influence from the other environmental factors. Certainly, uphills are going to slow you down, um, but the wind is not as much of a factor because your speed overall is so much lower. You don't have the changes in wind resistance and aerodynamics that have a big bearing on how much power it requires to go fast on the bike. So here, starting from the upper left and going in a clockwise direction, we've got three of the most common power meters that are out on the market, uh, and then one that's hopefully soon to be on the market in the bottom left. The upper left is this um, SRM, which is a German-based power meter. The actual unit itself is in the center of the crank arm spindle. 
And so then all of the strain gauges are coming from right in the center of the bike, close to where you're putting the power down on the crank arms. Moving to the right, we've got the power tap. This is the central unit of the rear hub. And then obviously there would be a wheel built around that. So you've got strain gauges inside that hub that are measuring the power being transferred from the, pet or from the crank arm through the chain and back to that rear hub. One more down, we've got the uh, quark, which you can see looks very similar to the SRM. And in function, they're almost identical. Uh, they just use a few different string gauges than the SRM and have a, a little bit different feature. Um, in the center, we've got the Garmin. And I put that there because that's one of the computers that a lot of people are able to use. N plus is the standard for transmitting that actual data from your power meter out to some sort of readout display. And so the Garmin is able to pick up that wireless signal from any of these different power meters and display that then on your handlebars for you. In the bottom left, we've got the vector pedal system, uh, which was scheduled to come out this spring, and now it's been delayed. Um, the idea behind that is going to be that there's strain gauges actually within those pedals, and that'll be uh, where you're measuring your power from. With all of these different systems, there's some advantages and disadvantages to each of them. The key thing that you're looking for with power, as I said before, is that you want something that's consistent and reliable. People talk a lot about sometimes the difference between precision and accuracy. And it's not as important that you have an accurate power meter as you have one that's precise. And what I mean by that is if you're really producing 200 watts and your power meter is reading 110 watts, that's not as big of a deal as long as it's always at 210 watts as it would be if you're really producing 200 watts and it's varying between, say, 180 and 220. Um, clearly, it's better to be a little bit off and be consistently off rather than to have one that's not as precise and it's giving you a wider range of numbers. So once you've got the power meter, the next thing that you need to look at is the software options that you have available. For the most part, they're, the devices come with some software or have access to some software as well. Power Agent uh, is the PowerTap software, SRM Win for SRM. Um, Garmin Connect is also available. These different software options have a wide range of quality, functionality, and compatibility. So uh, if you're using the SRM software, for instance, it's only going to work with the SRM. Um, each of them has little different tweaks that they add. So there may be things that you like about the software that comes with your device, but you're sort of limited in the ability that you have to customize that. Another option is WKO Plus, which is analogous to Training Peaks, but it's an actual computer-based uh, analysis tool. And so the great thing about WKO Plus is that you have almost an infinite amount of analysis and that it's compatible with all of the training devices. The same things that you would be able to work into with Training Peaks, you can work into with WKO Plus. Um, and ultimately, a lot of the functionality is very similar. As we move on to the Training Peaks, you can see that there. Uh, but the difference is that Training Peaks is available online. Um, and you have the addition of a calendar and workout planning features. and maybe lay out a plan for down the road later in the season. Wherever you are, you'll have access to your training information. You can pull that up and look at it, uh, share your files with other people and things like that very easily. Um, but overall, whatever software you choose to use, the key is downloading your data so that you can learn from it. Uh, a lot of athletes, when they first start, they put their power meter on their bike and they just ride with it. And that's what I would call training with power. But what we ultimately want to get people to the point of doing is training by power. And the distinction there is that they're seeing the numbers, they're committing different reference points to memory and learning from them so that they can improve the quality of their future training and make things more specific and more measurable as they go down the road. With each of the devices, you've got some ability to customize the screen that you have. Um, Garmin is great for this. The Jewel from PowerTap also has a lot of customization available. One of the key things to think about here is not overwhelming yourself with the available onboard data. There's way more stuff than you really need to see within the context of the ride. So focus instead on the key metrics that are quick and easy to read. Um, when you've got bigger numbers, that's the advantage with the Garmin is you have fewer things on your screen, you get a bigger display. So it's easier when you're going fast on a bumpy road to look down quickly and see the numbers that you want to see, rather than if you have the maximum number of, say, eight uh, different metrics, sometimes it can be a little bit harder to pick out the exact thing that you want to see and get a clear reading on it. 
save the detail of the section of the data for the post-ride analysis. So whether that's going, sitting back and going through the actual uh, computer head that you're using or to download your data and look at it that way, that's something that you can do when you've got a little bit more time. You can look at everything in context and see how it all fits together. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the data that I think is valuable within the ride. The first one at the top of the list is always going to be time. And you may wonder why I'm saying time rather than power. Regardless of how hard you're working, it's key first to know that you're out there working for a specific duration because that's how your races are ultimately going to be. If you're racing for, say, 100 miles, that's going to be anywhere between a four to six hour effort for most people. And if you're out only training for two hours or three hours, you're sort of underselling yourself in that case. Um, at the same time, if you're training for shorter events such as on the track, four-minute pursuit or a one-minute kilo or things like that, you want to dose those efforts out very specifically. Next thing then is going to be the actual power itself. And if you see nothing else on your screen, these would be the two things that I will want you to be able to look at. The power is the effort that you're actually doing, and so that gives you the ability to manipulate how hard you're working at any given time. The next thing that is very important and useful for cyclists is actually kilojoules. And the reason that this works out so well is because of a convenient relationship where kilojoules burned on the bike end up being almost a one-to-one -one relationship with calories burned. And so if you're trying to lose weight or optimize your body composition, you can look at the kilojoules that you burned on a given ride and say, OK, this is how many calories I burned, and this is how much food I need to replace in order to fuel myself, and also maybe to induce a slight deficit so that you can start to lose weight. The reason that that relationship works out is because we're actually burning a lot more total kilojoules, but a lot of that is given up as heat and energy loss in the system. The human body is about 25% efficient on the bike, and so we come back down to this one-to-one -one relationship. Some other things that you may want to see during the ride, one is speed. Ultimately, we end up putting a speedometer or Garmin or some sort of a power meter on the bike because we want to see speed. We want to know how fast we're going. It's fun to look at. Um, and in some cases, in races especially, that's really what it's all about. The power becomes a little bit secondary. It's a useful thing to see on there as well. In a lot of different training situations, cadence is also very valuable. Um, whether you're trying to work on muscular strength or higher cadences for form and efficiency, things like that, um, cadence can be useful to see as well. As I said before, when you start to use power, the heart rate is still a valuable tool. You just look at it at the expense of power. And so knowing the relationship between your heart rate and your power at different energy zones or at different points on a normal day and seeing how that varies from day to day gives you some insight into what's going on within your body. If you're producing more power at the same heart rate, that could be an indication of a couple of things. One could be that uh, you've actually improved your fitness so workouts that used to be or workloads that used to be fairly challenging for you are no longer quite as challenging on a relative basis, and you're able to produce more work and you're more efficient overall. The other thing that that potentially could indicate is that maybe you're tired, fatigued from the training that you've done, so your heart rate response is going to be a little bit blunted in that case. And you may be producing more power at a lower heart rate, but you're not going to be working quite as hard. And then the final thing is the distance. Um, you know, that comes right back into the time. The distance is not as valuable in a lot of ways because it's so dependent on the different conditions that you're going to encounter, whether that's terrain or uh, wind, things like that. Um, obviously, 20 miles in the mountains is much different than 20 miles in the flat. So take into account what's normal for your area and how that all fits together. With the interval data, the most important thing overall is this function on the computer that knowing how to set and review your interval and lap data. Um, you can see on the Jewel image that I've got here, there's a very obvious interval button. Um, with Garmin, they use a lap button. Um, it just depends on what your power meter is specifically. But the power meters, are try they try to design a head unit that's pretty simple where you can hit that button, store that data, and then uh, hit it again at the end of the interval to stop that data and progress on. Some of them even allow you to set up workouts before you start so that it'll automatically section off those intervals for you. 
at the end of the day, if you didn't do that, you could still go in and analyze it further, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but it's much more useful if you've sectioned off those distinct intervals uh, before you even start. The specific interval data that you'll want to see is time, current power, which I'll talk about in a little bit as well, and then depending on the circumstances, you may want to see speed, heart rate, or cadence. A lot of times all of those are available at the same time, but the relative importance of each of them depends on the circumstance. So with a long aerobic ride, for instance, that might be something where heart rate is a little bit more important. If you're doing race pace intervals, speed may be a little bit more important so you can get an understanding of how much power it takes to go a given speed. Uh, say you're trying to break the hour in a 40K time trial, how much power or how many watts does it take you to average 25 miles an hour? Um, and then for some specific types of training, again, such as the efficiency work or the low cadence work, um, where you're trying to build cycling-specific strength, that cadence piece may be a valuable part of uh, your interval data that you see. Normalized power is another thing that we'll talk about in a little bit, and that's something that um, is useful to look at post-ride and see how that fits in. We'll move on now to the training application piece, and I think this is the stuff that I think most people can really benefit from, with their, especially if they're new to training with power, how to get started and integrate this, gather some reference points, and start applying that training-based process to their actual rides. So field testing is one of the most important things that you start with. It provides reference points for your, your training going forward, as well as the progress that you've made from where you were in the past. Ideally, you want to have a field test of some sort for each energy system. The most important energy systems are going to depend on what your specific race goals are. Uh, but overall, there's three key ones. One is aerobic uh, or sort of endurance. The second one is lactate threshold. And then the third is VO2. There's different ways to get useful field tests for each of these. But one of the common ones with aerobic testing is to pick a fixed heart rate, such as 140 or maybe 150 beats per minute, and ride at that specific heart rate for a given duration of time, maybe for the last hour of a three-hour ride or something like that, and look at what your average power is at that specific heart rate. Over time, the trend that you would seem, tend to see would be higher aerobic power at that same heart rate. That's an increase in efficiency, increase in metabolic power. Um, Another way that you could approach that is to just go out and ride for five hours as hard as you could. Now, most people may think that that sounds a little bit crazy, but when you take that out to a five-hour appropriately paced test, the absolute amount of work that you're doing is going to have to be relatively low in order for you to be able to sustain that for that full five hours. Um, so those are two possible approaches for aerobic testing. For threshold testing, anything in the 20 to 40 minute test range is going to be a useful reference point. A 40K test, uh, time trial on the road, is sort of the, the gold standard. That's a full hour test for most people. Um, but regardless of what you're doing for that actual test, the fall off from 20 minutes to 40 minutes to 60 minutes is relatively small and relatively linear. So if you establish a reference point at 20 minutes, then you can draw some conclusions about that. And if you come back later and retest that 20 minute number, uh, and see some gains, then you can make it the assumption that your actual threshold power has probably improved. For VO2 power, we like to use the four-minute test. This is, I think, one of the hardest things that you can do as a cyclist. Uh, it's a long enough effort that you have to pace it really well, but the intensity of that effort is also so high that you really have to be on the red line pretty much the entire time. Um, and once you have that number, you can uh, plug it into some calculations to figure out what your actual VO2 max is. But you have that reference point that's useful for shorter intervals or measuring improvements in that specific system. The key features of an appropriate field test would be that it's repeatable, that it's consistent, and that it's predictable. So you want to try and choose a location that's convenient and available regularly. If it's uh, an office park area that's maybe only available after hours, that could be great, as long as that's a time that works out for you. Um, we were fortunate in our area to have a velodrome, and that was a very convenient place because you can take out a lot of the environmental factors. You're going around in a loop, so the wind kind of becomes neutralized. You don't have any of the stoplights and things like that. Um, people that live in more rural areas 
can often pick roads that are fairly low traffic and don't have too many interruptions. Those can be great places as well. Consistent is the other key. You don't want to, even if you're doing the same test, you don't want to be moving it around in different places all the time. But you also want to try to perform it under similar conditions. So performance in the heat, performance in the cold, uh, rain, humidity, all of those things can impact your result of your test. And so you want to try and minimize those extraneous variables as much as you can. Um, and then the predictability, again, comes back to the lack of turns or traffic con controls. Um, you don't want to be counting on rolling through a right turn and then all of a sudden have uh, a red light or something like that, that that interrupts your test. Once you've done some of those field test type efforts, critical power becomes the next thing that you're looking at. Ideally, at that point, you'd have a three to five hour power number that you're pretty confident in, a 20 to 60 minute power number that you're pretty confident in, and probably a four minute power that you're pretty confident in. But the useful thing about critical power is that you can follow this graph here that's available in Training Peaks, and it'll show you key durations from a five second effort all the way out to three hours. And these are records over time. So this is not just within a ride, although you are able to see that data as well. But you can look at this, and if you scrolled to one of those different points, for instance, at five second mark, and saw what date that power happened on, or further down the road at maybe the 20 minute mark, and what date that power happened on, you could look at the type of training that you were doing at that time of the year and see why that number was the best one that you'd ever produced. It could be location dependent too. If you were in an area that um, had long climbs and you're used to only training in the flats, that may have been the best chance you had to get a good steady resistance throughout that 20 minute effort where normally you encounter some downhills and things like that that interrupt the steadiness of that power. But the key here would be looking at these different numbers and understanding what you can produce for different durations. That way not only can you assess your progress within the course of a season as well as over the course of several seasons if you've got this data, but you can also gather some reference points to say, okay, if I'm going to do these one minute efforts that I've never done before, but I have done some four minute efforts and I know that I can do X power, then maybe that's a decent starting point for how hard I should be doing those one minute efforts. Looking at the interval specifically, this graph that you see here is very similar to the one that Kelly showed earlier. Uh, in this case, the athlete was doing a 10-minute block, five one-minute intervals, and then a second 10-minute block. And he had set a power meter or set an interval on his power meter when he did that. And so that's why we see these uh, seven different intervals already highlighted. Off to the right that we don't have on the screen here, you would be able to click on the individual interval and see what power he did for those given durations. You would also have the ability, if you just had this graph open ahead of you, to drag and select that segment, for instance, that first 10-minute segment, and see that power for that unit displayed on the right as well. That would include not only the power, but also any other data that may uh, be part of that, such as speed, heart rate, cadence, and so on. Time on target is another big thing that I try to coach a lot of my athletes on. We've got power spent in different training zones on two different rides. In the first one, you can see a lot of time spent in zone two and a little bit of time in zone three, a little bit less in zone one, and then very little in zones four, five, and six. And then in the second ride, you can see a lot of time in the recovery zone, zone one, a lot of time in zone four, which equates to threshold power, and a little bit of time in sort of that zone three and zone four, but most of it is balanced out in that uh, zone four window. So in the first case, that's a textbook example of a long, steady aerobic ride. Ideally there, you would want to spend a lot of time targeting that endurance system by training in zone two, not having a lot of time in those higher zones, um, but you also don't want to be going so easy that you're just spinning away and coasting because remember that zone one encompasses a lot from the zero all the way up to the top of your zone one. So maybe you are still getting some aerobic benefit near the top of zone one, but once you get down below, um, say 50% of threshold power, you're not doing a lot of meaningful work for that system. If you can shift some of that balance into that zone two window, you know you're getting good quality work. In the second example, where you've got a lot of zone four time, this was a, an example of a threshold workout. This one's a bit skewed because it didn't include a whole lot of warm up and cool down time, although the 
uh, recovery and some of the warm-up is included within that zone one early on and some of that zone two as well as part of that. But the key thing is that if you're doing two by 20 threshold intervals, for instance, at the end of the day, you would know that you wanted to spend 40 minutes working on that threshold system. And so if you look at this graph and scrolled over it, it would show a pop-up of how much time was actually under that bar. And if you were targeting 40 minutes and came up with, say, 35, then that's a pretty good target for that zone. But if you came up with only 20 minutes, that would be an indication that you were bouncing around a lot and not spending as much time in the zone that you were trying to target as uh, would have been ideal. So when we were talking about the interval data before, we talked about showing current power. This is a slide that I just made up with different data to illustrate my point. What you can see is that the yellow line is the current power at five second intervals over the course of a five minute effort. The blue line is the rolling average power as this person goes through the interval. So as they go from basically a dead stop up to their initial power, it's common to see a little bit sur a small surge. Um, this one's a little bit blunted over what it might typically be, but the key thing is that the average power comes up very quickly. The person starts to drop their power back up and it sort of ebbs and flows as they go through this five minute effort. And then you can see as they get out to about four minutes, that power starts to tail off. That yellow line is dropping. Um, you know, that's a pretty common scenario if you're running out of juice at the end of an effort. Uh, but what you see when you look at the average power is that early on there's some little ebbs and flows because there's fewer data points being averaged. So it's more sensitive to those changes in power that are taking place. Look right around 105 seconds. You can see there's a big swing from power below 300 watts to up to almost 350 watts. And the change in the average power at that time is pretty small. The other thing that you see is at the end of the interval, when that power starts to tail off, there is a noticeable drop in the average power, but it's relatively small. So if you're displaying average power on your screen, it's hard to see it and have enough sensitivity to know how much work you're really doing at the moment and adjust those things as you change. That's one of the frustrations that I think new power users have a lot of times is that it bounces around so much. And that can be hard to get used to um, because you're used to seeing heart rate or speed and things like that that don't change quite as frequently. But that variability that you see from pedal stroke to pedal stroke with power is really where some of the value is because you're able to look at what you're doing every second and see what that effort really is. So we mentioned before normalized power, and then we'll add to that intensity factor and training stress score, which is the IF and the TSS. These are all metrics that have come up or been developed with Training Peaks and WKO Plus, and they're interesting ways to put a little bit of a spin on the numbers that you see. We'll talk a little bit more about how they may apply to specific rights later, but having sort of an intellectual understanding of how they work will be helpful in that case. So normalized power is basically an adjusted average power value for non-steady efforts that predicts how hard you would have worked if that effort was completely steady. This is really something where if you were doing um, short intervals or something like a criterium or a road race where there's a lot of variability, the effort that you experience is going to be pretty different than the average power you actually do. And so normalized power tries to account for that a little bit. The intensity factor is the normalized power of a ride divided by your threshold power. Typically, that's going to be a number somewhere between 0.5 and 0.8, depending on how hard the ride was. For some higher intensity efforts, such as like a 40K time trial or um, maybe a really hard crit, things like that, you'll get numbers up into the 0.9 um, and 1.0. Occasionally, for an effort less than an hour, uh, you may see numbers up above 1.0. Training stress score then is the measure of the total workload for the ride, and it also accounts for normalized power. So the actual formula for TSS is basically time multiplied by normalized power multiplied by intensity factor, all divided by threshold power. So it's analogous to the kilojoules that we talked about earlier, whereas the kilojoules were equivalent to calories, but they were also a measure of the total workload for the system. Kilojoules are very easy to calculate. They're basically uh, the average power of your ride multiplied by the number of hours you rode 
multiplied by 3.6 as a constant, and that tells you the number of kilojoules that you burn during a ride. And as you get a sense for how much uh, effort is a, a 2,000 kilojoule ride for you versus a 3,000 kilojoule ride and so on, you can kind of get a general sense for how hard that ride is. In the same way with training stress score, you can start to look at a 100 TSS ride and 150 and a 200 TSS ride and get a sense for how hard that workload is for your body. And just as a general reference point, training stress score is all based on 100 TSS points being equal to an hour of threshold power. So in theory, a 100 TSS ride done in an hour should be an equivalent load for the body as compared to a two-hour ride that was also 100 TSS. Although the one was also a much easier workload, the total load is the same. So that brings us up to something, our weekly work. And there's different ways that you can look at this. One of the most basic is with duration. Uh, you can see that graph on the far left. And this is just the actual hours ridden week in and week out. So you can see a couple of bigger weeks in there, a lot of lower weeks where um, periods of less training, maybe time off and things like that. And then you see the kilojoules in the center. And these two graphs basically mirror each other pretty precisely. You can see a few cases looking at just before that sort of 3-5 marker where there's two big spikes back to back. And the second one, when you look at the kilojoules, the second week is a little bit higher kilojoule output than the first week. Whereas those two weeks are basically the same amount of total training time. So the conclusion that you could draw then would be that you worked a little bit harder during the rides on that second week. You can also look at total load in terms of TSS. And this graph here on the right combines both TSS and intensity factor. But what you can see is that trend in TSS being similar to the trend in uh, the time, the total training duration, as well as the kilojoules. But when you look at that second week again, um, comparing that sort of 3-5 time frame, you can spot those two big blue spikes that come up just a little bit above the green ones, which reference the intensity factor. And notice that the relative change is much bigger with TSS. And so with kilojoules, everything is coming down to that average power. So if you worked a little bit harder on the average, that'll show up in the kilojoules. But if you had a lot of higher efforts well above your threshold, that'll show up to an even greater degree when you look at it from the standpoint of TSS. This chart, the performance management chart, is a really useful one for long-term planning for athletes doing uh, fewer events over the course of a year or maybe one really big event that they want to taper for, this is a great way to um, kind of look at your progression and develop your training around that. Basically, you have three different metrics that are being incorporated into this graph. The pink line is ATL, which stands for acute training load, and the blue line is chronic training load, or CTL. Basically, the acute load is a form of fatigue. How tired you are at a moment in time. It, the uh, units for both of these are TSS per day. And so the pink line or the ATL is measuring the rolling average of training load TSS over the past seven days. The blue line, on the other hand, is measuring that rolling average over the past 42 days. So just like when we looked at the uh, average power versus current power, the ATL responds much more quickly because there's fewer numbers involved in the computation, and so the averages are changed much more frequently. When you're looking at a six-week window with the CTL, those numbers respond a little bit more smoothly. And then our final metric here is training stress balance, or TSB, that's the yellow line. And this is just the actual difference between your ATL and CTL at any point along the graph. So you can see that because CTL is fairly linear and the ATL is jumping around all the time, the training stress balance line is basically the inverse of that acute training load. So while acute training load basically is uh, analogous to the amount of fatigue that you have from recent training, that chronic training load is analogous to form or fitness that you have from past training. So the work that you've done two and three months ago is still important, and that's part of your fitness base but you're benefiting from that now, whereas you're suffering from the current training stress. 
So this is sort of a textbook example of classic periodization. You can see the first block where ATL ramps up pretty quickly, drops off a little bit, and then ramps up again, uh, has another little drop off, and then ramps up to the high point at about 85 TSS per day. And then there's a big reduction in ATL. But while that's happening, the change in the CTL is much more slow. And so the training stress balance shifts to a positive number for the first time. It came up to a positive number again during rest weeks. But you can see that the, the training stress balance is at its most positive point, almost 20 training stress balance points, when that big rest week is occurring. So that would be a great time to have a good result at a race and then get back into regular training again. You can see that the acute load is just a little bit above the chronic load at this point. So while you gave up some of your fatigue by taking that rest week um, around early March, you didn't lose all of the fitness that you developed previously. So you can get back into that stress, kind of come right back to that load. But notice how when you get to that second phase after the big drop, the acute load is almost right on top of the chronic load, sort of day in and day out. So the training stress balance is staying kind of right around zero at that point. That's a, that might be a time where you would look at it and say, maybe I'm getting to the point a little bit where I'm still fatigued, but I need to shift my training around because I'm not doing enough work to accelerate my growth. And then one of the cool new features in Training Peaks is the ability to plan workouts into the future. So you can see where the lines become dotted. That's a case where workouts haven't been planned into the future, but the graph is responding as if there's um, zeros in the, in the charts there. So if you plan future workouts with TSS, you would see gra graphs similar to what you have earlier in the season when you have those hard numbers in there. So we'll wrap things up here with a little bit of racing application. Uh, and this first example comes from a mass start type race. This could be either a criterium or a road race, something like that that has a lot of variability. The graph itself may be a little bit hard to see because the um, zones that I've placed on here as well as the power file are pretty similar colors. But you can see the dashed line that equates the threshold power. And the key trend is that there's a lot of time below that line and very low powers in zone one as well as lots of short surges up into that zone 6 power or zone 5 plus, depends on the training zone system that you're using. Um, and a lot of that time spent above threshold power. You can also see how that breaks down in the little power by zones chart in the lower right. Lots of time in zone 1, lots of time in zone 6. Relatively little time in any of the other zones in between. So here, a lot of time, you could look at the average power for the race, but you have all these low power numbers that are really dragging your power down. A much more telling metric of how hard you're working in that race would be your normalized power. It's sort of flattening out the overall load and looking at the effort required to do those more intense efforts above threshold power. But the key thing overall here is that when you're in this race situation, you can't worry too much about the actual power because you've just got to do what the race dictates. Speed is much more important in this case, drafting and energy conservation. After the fact, you can come back and look at it and see what kind of peak powers you generated, what kind of power you may have had during the final sprint or during a breakaway effort or something like that. But during the race, you need to just focus on being a little bit more in the moment. Our next example is from a time trial. And the actual time trial itself comes just from the highlighted blue segment in this case. You can see that the trend here is much more steady. There are still a few little surges because this particular time trial had a few minor hills. And there's also a slight downward trend in power as this athlete works through. This was an indication that pacing maybe could have been improved a little bit. Um, ideally, you would want to see a pretty flat, steady power profile over the course of the race. Um, there's some little nuances with uh, speed and wind conditions and things like that that may come into play as well. But ideally, on a flat time trial, you would want a fairly steady power profile. So you can see right away the big difference between a mass start race and a time trial type race. In this case, normalized power and average power are going to be very similar to each other. Looking at the power by zones, you can see much like that threshold workout that we did earlier on, there's a lot of time spent in one training zone. In this case, it shows up mostly in zone three. Um, 
the actual graph came from a time when the athlete was new to his time trial bike. He hadn't adapted to it very fully yet. And so he was spending a lot of time um, actually below his measured threshold, which had been done on the road bike. And that sort of ended up being in that zone three slash tempo zone. Sentry rides are also very popular Grand Fondo type options. In this case, you can see, like the crit, there's a lot of variability. Um, but I've overlaid the elevation profile behind the graph. And so you can see that some of that elevation is causing some of these changes. If you really look at where those climbs take place, you can see that power tends to become steadier during those times. So looking at the breakdown of time and zones, again, you see a lot of time at low wattage. Uh, presumably this person was probably riding in a group for the most part, and so there would have been a lot of times where they were maybe in the draft and not working very hard. Coasting down the hills would also bring the power down. But then after that zone one, their time was fairly well spread out between zone two, three, and four. And then in five and six, you see a drop off. So up to threshold power, you can usually spend a decent amount of time there because the relationship to effort produced and energy expenditure is fairly linear. But once you get up into those higher zones, it becomes much harder to sustain that effort for a long period of time. And so that's why those numbers will always tend to be less over a longer duration. With triathlon, depending on the distance that you're racing, you can see a lot of different approaches or, or pacing strategies. In this case, this was a half Ironman race. This was 70.3 uh, nationals last year. And you can see that there is a lot of elevation change present in this race as well. But compared with the century ride on the previous slide, the changes in power are much more muted. And notice also that they're sort of right over that zone three window um, almost throughout the entire ride. So not only is the athlete trying to pace themselves pretty steadily regardless of the terrain, but they're also trying to target a pretty specific window. And in training, you would want to find out what the maximum sustainable power for this type of duration is, and then use that as a reference point once you go into a race. You could do the same thing for uh, an Olympic distance race or an Ironman distance race. Obviously, you would need to adjust where those reference points are, but the goal is finding the highest pace that you can sustain over the duration that would also let you run well once you come out of T2. Manipulating those two variables is something that can also be useful for a lot of athletes. If you're a great runner, play around with your bike intensity and see how hard you can work on the bike to the point where it doesn't adversely affect your run and what that total split of bike run is. Try to optimize that number. If you're a strong cyclist, maybe you want to work harder so you can build the biggest gap that you can before you get to the run. But if that leaves your leg shot when you get to the run, then it doesn't really pay off for you. So again, it comes back to always trying to optimize that bike run split by maximizing those two variables and experimenting with them. So that wraps, wraps up the formal part of my presentation, and I'm ready to take any questions that anybody has now. Thanks, Jason. We do have a few questions, and if for some reason we don't get to your question, um, you can either contact Jason or contact Training Peak depending on what your question is about. So the first question we have is in regards to um, your field testing slide, Jason. And the question is, would you advise against testing indoors on rollers or trainers? Absolutely not. Um, rollers in particular may be something that isn't ideal. It depends on the specific model of rollers that you have and how much resistance you can generate. But a lot of the uh, training that we do at VQ is done indoors on the copy trainer. Uh, we're able to get pretty much any amount of resistance that we need from people that are very beginner athletes up to people that are very experienced. Um, and the nice thing about the trainer is that you remove all of that variability that you get from some of the outdoor riding. It's easy to pick the same type of a setup and measure that effort very precisely. One of the things to keep in mind, though, is that a lot of people have uh, a harder time producing power on the trainer than they do outside. Um, whether this is just motivational or if it's something related to heat management, um, things like that, there's no real reason that you shouldn't be able to produce the same amount of power on the trainer 
if you're familiar with riding on the trainer regularly. But keep that in mind that the numbers you see on the trainer may not be exactly the same as what you would get from an equivalent test outdoors. Great. Thank you, Jason. So another question. Based on your experience, where do you see more precision? Is it in hub or crank power-based devices? Um, both units are very, very precise. Uh, I've used both on one bike at the same time, and at the end of a ride, I've come up to be only one watt apart. Um, as we talked about earlier, if you're thinking about accuracy, there could be slight differences there where you may end up with one that's higher or lower, but that should be a case that's um, pretty consistent over time. So if one is always higher, then that should be the trend that you see. The real distinction between the hub-based versus crank-based units is going to depend on your uses of the bike. So if you're constantly changing wheels, um, whether that's for racing or you know in cyclocross, different types of conditions, things like that, it's useful to have a crank-based power meter. You can swap those wheels out and always have that power available on the bike. Um, whereas if you try to do that with uh, a hub-based unit, you've got to have a race wheel and a training wheel and different things like that. The other reason that you may think about it is if you're using lots of different bikes, um, for instance, a cross bike, a time trial bike, a uh, road bike, with a hub-based unit, you can switch that wheel between all of those different bikes very easily. Um, you know, you may have to switch the tire over as well, but you've got one power meter that works on all of those bikes. There may be cases where uh, in racing you would need to figure out a different solution, but if you are primarily just focused on the numbers in training, then you could use that one wheel in all of those applications. Great, thank you, Jason. So another question we have is, how come it's so hard to keep the power up when going in the tailwind on a higher gear? I can easily ride at my FPP when going uphill or against the wind, but when I go on 53 to 12 in the tailwind, I struggle a lot. In one case, partly it comes down to the gravity that's available on an uphill. Um, and the aerodynamic resistance from the wind is similar to the effect of gravity, ultimately, in that you've got more to push against. Um, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon, though, because I think athletes that are accustomed to riding hills, I think generally are able to do exactly that pretty well, that they can produce more power on an uphill with that extra resistance. When they get into uh, downhill or tailwind sections, even if you get to the biggest gear, oftentimes what happens is the mechanical advantage of that gear has kind of been maxed out. So the only thing that's left is that you can um, increase your cadence. But the other thing, too, is that as you get to higher and higher speeds, it becomes exponentially harder to go faster. Um, so you've got to produce more and more power. And it may just be the, um, the ability of the system to manage that higher power, but you also don't have the same resistance ahead of you. You're sort of getting always pushed forward, and there's these little gaps um, that influence your ability to keep that effort very steady. On the other hand, you have some athletes that are more familiar with riding uh, in flatter terrain and, and tailwinds. They get a little bit better at keeping that power up. Uh, if it gets too fast, it's still just something that's kind of impossible to keep up with. And at a certain point, you look at um, is it really worth continuing to work hard to keep the power up, or am I better off maybe scaling my power back and going a little bit slower um, and, and still saving that energy but still going almost as fast? That may be something for time trials or triathlons where it's not a matter of um, losing the group or something like that. Great. Thank you, Jason. I think we have time for another one. So. Jason, how do you feel about looking at 3-second average power or 30-second average power, which can be displayed on the Garmin units? Looking at 30-second average power, of course, makes sense only for longer than 30 seconds or one minute. Right. Um, I think the 3-second one can be a valuable thing. Sometimes the sensitivity of the 1-second average can be a little bit hard to deal with. Um, and the 3-second smooths a lot of that out without losing all of the sensitivity that you need. Uh, so that can be something that's pretty useful, especially as you're sort of getting used to it. Um, 
what a lot of athletes find is that they become more familiar training with power, their pedal stroke actually becomes a little bit more efficient as well, and they don't have as much variation that's sort of noisy and distracting. Uh, the 30-second number, in some cases, I think it can be useful, especially on maybe a long ride where uh, the variance is able to be a little bit wider, but um, you know that would be something for uh, probably wouldn't be using an effort like that for any real specific measured intervals, whether they're short one to four minute intervals, longer 20 to 30 minute intervals. Great, thank you, Jason. I think that's all the time we have, um, but feel free to sign up for additional webinars or watch Jason's webinar again. So thank you very much, Jason. Job well done, and thank you all for attending today. Thank you.